Okay, I think we are going to go ahead and get started and a few people can come in while uh, we're doing the introductions. Uh, so my name is David Gottfried. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure. Um, and I want to welcome you to our semi-monthly NNCI webinar series. Um, and this month, uh, we are actually combining our computation webinar with our education webinar. Um, and I'll introduce uh, today's uh, speaker in a few minutes. Um, just want to remind you that you can see all of the NNCI events, both online and in person, uh, on our, on our um, website, the NNCI website, nnci.net. Um, and you can also view uh, past recordings or recordings of past webinars on our YouTube channel. So if you just uh, search NNCI YouTube, you'll get the, the correct link to that YouTube channel. Uh, a reminder that we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, and you can enter those into the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen, or the, the, the uh, it'll go to the right, but the click on the bottom of the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, just a word about our next month's speaker. So on September 28th, at also at 4 p.m. Eastern time, uh, our speaker will be Professor Tony Lowe from the University of Minnesota. And again, you'll see that information at all of the places where you get NNCI webinar information. Um, so it's a real pleasure today to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Azad Naimi. Um, Azad uh, got his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at Sharif University. Uh, and then his master's degree and PhD at, uh, in, in electrical and computer engineering here at Georgia Tech, which is where I am as well. Um, he was a research engineer in the Microelectronics Research Center uh, for several years before joining the electrical and computer engineering faculty uh, here at Georgia Tech in 2008. Um, he is also uh, the, an associate director of the NNCI coordinating office, uh, particularly in the, for the computation activities. Uh, Azad has number, won a number of awards, including most recently um, the inaugural James Mindel Innovators Award from the IEEE uh, Solid State Circuit Society. Um, and so I'm going to pass it off to Azad, and he's going to really tell us about uh, using games to teach uh, physics principles. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, share with you the work that we've been doing in this area. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, uh, Professor Nassim Parvin and Dr. Aditya Anupam in Digital Media Program here at Georgia Tech. Um, our students face many challenges learning topics in semiconductor physics and quantum uh, in general. Um, the uh, the reasons are many, but if I want to summarize a few main reasons, uh, many of the topics in these courses contradict uh, the students' everyday experiences, and the students often uh, say that these core these these concepts don't make sense. And what they mean by they don't make sense is that they they are not consistent with their uh, past experiences. For example, it does not make sense for an electron to tunnel through a barrier, for, through an energy barrier, or uh, uh, it's not um, trivial that you can find an electron um, at any place and you cannot predict where it's going to be. It's only that you can know where uh, it is more likely to find it. So these concepts um, are not consistent with students' everyday experiences, and that causes this um, um, incomfort in dealing with these topics. So as a result, the students create their own mental models uh, from various sources and often use incorrect analogies and explanations, which, um, which cause problems later down the road. And even when they learn the mathematical formalism and they can solve problems, uh, if you ask them conceptual questions, uh, in many cases, they, um, they struggle and, and they have not uh, grasped the fundamental uh, concepts in a deep and insightful manner. And our focus on math 
and our uh, and, and theory in many cases um, does not shift the mental models of the of the students. Um, then and, and at this at the same time we know that the ex, uh, experiential and active learning in general enhances uh, students engagement, retention, and it also accelerates um, gaining intuition. But the challenge is that many of the concepts uh, in this area are unobservable within the bounds of normal human experience. The implications are enormous. Um, in a survey that was done in, uh, uh, in the School of ECE by my colleagues, the students ranked ECE 3040 as the most difficult and challenging course. This is the course that introduces the students with these uh, um, topics and also uh, semiconductor devices and circuits. This reputation poses a major challenge for us in recruiting students into these fields. And also for the students who attend these classes, we, we struggle to keep them engaged and retain them. And this is also quite problematic for underrepresented minorities and um, hinders recruiting from them and retaining them. And in, in, in general, it also is exacerbates the, ex, the already existing inequity in learning opportunities because now the instructor becomes even more important. So our hypothesis uh, has been that if we create immersive virtual worlds that allow students to visualize and experience these fundamental concepts, then we can address many of these challenges and we can actually accelerate the development of intuition, um, not only for our own students, but also for a large and diverse group of students around the world. So today I'm gonna to discuss two main areas. One is digital games as one implementation of uh, such immersive uh, virtual uh, worlds. And the other one is interactive visualizations. So uh, for, for the digital games, I will start by explaining why we think uh, digital games are particularly suitable for quantum physics. Then I'll introduce two of the games that we have developed, Particle in a Box and Psi and Delta. Uh, then some design aspects of uh, these games and then evaluating the educational value of these games. Then I'll move to, towards interactive visualizations, and these are geared toward um, introductory courses on semiconductor physics. And some of the topics that I will cover are listed here um, as examples to show you how these interactive visualizations can help students uh, gain better insight and, um, and intuition about these concepts beyond what they can learn from solving mathematical problems. So in the area of digital games for education, there has been a lot of work and a lot of research and uh, many efforts have shown that games are, you know, the students find games interesting and enjoyable and in some cases uh, more than the traditional approaches. But in terms of the educational values and how effective that they can be, um, there's no consensus. And some uh, research suggests that it can be quite effective and some suggest that the evidence is not as strong. In most cases, um, the elements that make a game uh, effective are identified as fantasy, complexity, and control. If these elements are integrated in a um, genuine way in the game, uh, then um, the game can become quite successful. And also I want to add that in recent years, there's been this gamification trend in education, which um, uh, arguably is quite flawed. And the idea behind gamification is that if you take any repetitive boring task and you provide a reward system and incentives and 
take advantage of the competitive nature of people, you can entice them to start doing that, that task uh, often enough and uh, master doing that. But um, there's a lot of evidence that such an approach can decrease intrinsic motivation and it doesn't work with many students. So our approach is not uh, following this kind of gamification trend, rather creating a genuinely enjoyable experience where they can, um, they can have fun and at the same time learn uh, about these concepts. So why digital games are particularly suitable for quantum physics? Well, first of all, by working in these uh, environments and playing um, in a quantum world, they can interact with quantum behavior frequently enough such that they get used to it. So the fact that we say something does not make sense, it's because it contradicts our expectations. But if if you interact with something often enough, uh, then you accept it as it is, and it's not as unusual anymore as it was at the beginning. Um, in games, it's quite common to interact with words that are governed by very different laws, um, and players uh, rarely complain about the fact that um, the rules of a game does not match what we have in our everyday life. Quantum physics is also based on probability, which would, uh, which can be only experienced through repetition. So the only way that you can see the probability is by repeating the same experiment and see the pattern and see uh, what is more likely and what is less likely. And the repetitive nature of activities in a game make it uh, very, very suitable for this kind of uh, learning. And also this probabilistic nature makes it exciting because there's this element of luck. You don't, every time that you play, something new may happen and, uh, and you cannot predict it exactly. Uh, there is room to convert the mathematical concepts to, into a rule system in the form of game mechanics and then uh, learn and master it. And, and the richness of the concepts that we have in quantum physics provide endless possibilities to formulate various game um, ideas. And it's needless to say that fantasy, complexity, and control all can be present in these games. Um, about 10 years ago, um, we started this project and we recruited students from different disciplines across campus at Georgia Tech, from visual design to interaction design, programming, uh, physics, electrical engineering. And um, we started with various game ideas uh, uh, made prototypes, tested them, played with them, and went through many iterations. And after a few years, this Particle in a Box was the first game that we uh, finished. This is based on the idea of uh, Particle in a Box, which is often used at the beginning to teach students about quantum physics. It's an infinitely deep potential well. Uh, and it's very easy to solve the Schrodinger equation for this case and find the, uh, uh, the wave function, the probability, and show the quantization of energy and many concepts uh, can, uh, can be, be being explained over here. And also the impact of confinement in a small area. But at the same time, this concept has a lot of similarities with uh, what we have in a classical world and a lot of differences. So this game takes players through these two different words to highlight the similarities and differences. So here is a quick demo of this game. Um, if you go to the uh, website, learnqm.gotit.edu, uh, you can either download it or play it online. Um, it starts with the classical word and with a brief tutorial. Uh, this is a frictionless surface. There is a ball with an initial um, 
energy and this energy is small so that this ball is confined within this region and the students are reminded about what is the potential energy which in this case it reflects the same or mirrors the um, uh, the elevation profile and what is kinetic energy what is the total energy and uh, if the uh, particle doesn't have enough energy it cannot go beyond the energy barrier so the player needs to avoid this ball and at the same time needs to feed this ball with some energy balls to give it more energy and as it gains more energy it can go to higher elevations and unlock uh, different levels so um, in the next level they will see another uh, profile for energy potential energy the, here the elevation is different and again the concept is the same just to refresh them about what is potential energy what is kinetic energy and the fact that everything is predictable here if they uh, plan and move correctly they can always avoid this ball and um, everything is deterministic here but later uh, once they unlock this level and go to the quantum world, then um, things change. So here is when the scaling happens, they go through the, um, uh, through a shrinking process. And now here in the quantum world, there is this quantum wire and the electron can, is confined within this quantum wire. And because of um, the quantum nature here, we don't know where the electron is until a measurement is done. And then again, after the measurement, we won't know where the electron is. But we can repeat this experiment. And if we keep track of where the electron appears each time, then after a while, we will see the pattern. And this pattern basically represents the probability density function. And then, uh, uh, the the point of minimum possibility, probability, maximum probability, and also the potential energy here is very different. Again, they see uh, the potential energy, which is the same everywhere within the confinement of this quantum wire, but the probability of finding the electron is quite different in different places. They see the quantization of the energy and the fact that they need a light bulb which can shine the perfect photon in order to excite the electron to the next level. This um, is because of the quantization of energy. And now they see that in the next, in the second energy level, there is a node in the middle, and that's a safe place to stand because the electron will uh, rarely appear close to that uh, place. By, um, by exciting the electron to the higher energy levels, uh, each time they will see that the wave function changes and, um, and, and, and the unpredictability of finding the electron is there, but there are certain places that are safe and they should avoid the places that are more likely to, um, to find the electron in them. Again, they're going to go through different levels and see different energy profiles and they will see that the uh, probability density function changes quite drastically with uh, every new potential profile and also it's possible to find the electron outside the energy barrier so even though the electron now has this much energy sometimes it appears in these regions it's not confined only within this region um, and also these the separation between the energy levels it's uh, it's not uniform and it depends on the potential profile this was a successful game um, we participated in some competitions um, uh, in a in a competition with the direct vote of about uh, 250 students uh, from high school and middle school uh, we received the students choice award for this game um, then we decided to expand this and um, we developed another game, which this one is a collaborative game. Two players can play together because research has shown that um, students learn better when, uh, to, when they talk to each other and they 
try to accomplish a task together. And um, just to, um, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm gonna show you the uh, promotional video that we made for this uh, video. So uh, these two video games have been used um, in many of the outreach activities um, at Georgia Tech and also in other places. Um, uh, we participated in another competition and we were selected to showcase this at the, uh, at the uh, National uh, uh, Museum of American History in DC. Um, this was a, a Creativity and Innovation Festival for a few days, and and um, and we find um, a lot of appeal for this kind of game both at the um, at the middle school and high school level, and also for undergraduate students who may just want to get some introduction into these concepts or have taken courses in this area, but um, they want to get more. Um, into uh, or have a more experiential uh, learning uh, opportunity. So uh, before I get into the education, the, the value or evaluation of this game, a few words about the character design in these um, games, just to show you the kind of work that goes into developing a game like this. Um, it's a key factor in designing any game because the character is what allows players to inhabit roles that they otherwise cannot. And at the same time, it can reinforce uh, social and cultural stereotypes. And it's good to remember that the gaming community suffers from a lack of diversity that is well documented. And, um, and the kind of characters that you, get, you see in games um, they all, you know, in, in many cases, they, they contribute to these kinds of cultural and social stereotypes. So um, for us, uh, as an educational game, this is quite important. And also research shows that players uh, relate more to characters that uh, they feel they are similar to them. Uh, as we started this work, um, the challenge for us was how to develop a game character that is relatable um, uh, across the race and gender and all sorts of identity spectra, but at the same time um, does not reinforce any existing stereotypes. So our first approach was uh, to develop an abstract character. Um, we, the, we, we, we used a minimalistic character design to limit its association with any particular identity. And our hope was that players can project uh, whatever identity um, they want to this uh, character. The name was also chosen to be Psy, which is not associated with any gender. But after we developed the game and we did our evaluations, it seemed that many people associated with this character with a male character. So for the next game, um, we explored uh, a host of uh, options, a host of families of options for characters. And after doing some experimentation, we uh, narrowed down on robots because robots in general are, are 
are um, neutral and also um, in many science fiction uh, stories and movies uh, they are associated with doing tasks that humans normally cannot then with various kinds of robots we narrowed down on this kind of robot which was uh, suitable for the actions and effects that we wanted and also we allowed it to be made um, um, you know uh, accessorized um, based on whatever um, preference the player may have so this was just a quick recap of some of the design decisions that were made uh, and the design process for uh, the game characters of these games. Uh, a lot more detail is provided in this uh, publication about design challenges and uh, some of the solutions that we picked. Now, in terms of the educational value, uh, uh, we did this study with the particle in a box and we recruited students from the microelectronics microelectronic circuits course at, at the school of ECE at Georgia Tech. In this course, uh, quantum physics is introduced uh, briefly in the first few session uh, usually, and therefore the students had some familiarity with quantum physics, but uh, they were not experts. So at, uh, for the pretest, 15 multiple choice questions uh, uh, were asked and uh, some of the questions the students were required to uh, provide some explanations so later we can see why they chose uh, answers that they did. Then um, uh, there were some questions that gauged student comfort level and also we had some con and all of the questions were conceptuals and they covered introductory topics in classical and quantum uh, physics. Then they had a PlayStation that each player played the game individually, and we observed them uh, to see how they interact and, and, and where they pause and what are their reactions uh, as they played. Then uh, for the post-test, the questionnaire was the same as the pre-test, but with some additional uh, uh, Likert uh, scale questions and some subjective questions to get better feedback uh, from them about the game. They were not allowed to play the game while they were answering these post-test um, questions. And at the end, there was a focus group to discuss their experience and their impressions and why they, they, they answered questions the way that they did. These are the uh, results for the five educational outcomes, uh, the concepts that we were trying to gauge each concept. Um, there were a few questions that covered it. Um, the mean uh, pre-score values and the post-score values are given here. These are the metrics that are used to evaluate the, um, the significance of the change in score. And without going through much detail, um, because you know, for each metric, there is a threshold that shows when uh, the effect is significant, when it is medium, or when it is small. And in, in, for several of these topics, uh, we saw a, a significant improvement in, uh, in, learn, in, in learning those concepts. Um, in terms of the qualitative questions, uh, enjoyment was an interesting uh, question. Um, on a scale of one to five, about uh, more than 70% rated it four or higher. And there was a good correlation or a large correlation between the score that they um, uh, got and how enjoyable they ranked it. In terms of comfort level, um, pre-test 70% rated two or lower how comfortable they are with these con with, with the particle in a box concept and post test uh, about 65 percent rated it um, uh, four or um, above this time the correlation was smaller uh, with the total score so the comfort level and total score uh, it was not as correlated as uh, the enjoyment was now, lesson learned, um, obviously there's a lot of room uh, for work here, but from what we've done so far, 
the key elements needed for an engaging and effective interactive experience exist here. Uh, we can transform some of the mathematical concepts uh, into a rule system and um, develop the game mechanics that uh, reinforces the, the learning of the concepts that we want to uh, communicate. The repetitive nature of the games make them suitable for learning probabilistic concepts. Uh, by spending time in this environment, this, this, the players gradually uh, can get used to quantum behavior and, uh, and find it less weird. Also, students reported a significant improvement in their comfort level because this comfort level is always correlated with how engaged they will remain with the course. Uh, if they feel that something they, they're not comfortable with a topic, then uh, we will have more challenges uh, down the road to keep them engaged. Um, as I said, the um, these tools are available online and they can be easily used for outreach activities. Um, uh, you or your students can easily uh, play with them and then um, uh, use them in any kind of activities with younger kids to get them excited about this field. Now moving to a more formal set of uh, tools to uh, help students visualize and, uh, and, and understand uh, semiconductor physics concepts are interactive visualizations. And this is a much more recent um, work that we have started about um, two or three years ago. And right now we have 12 chapters available on our website. Um, the approach that we've taken in this uh, visualization is that we start from the familiar and then move to new concepts. Um, we superimpose side by side um, the visualizations of real and abstract concepts. For example, on one side, they see electrons and holes in real space. Then on the other side, they see um, the EK diagram and how electrons uh, move in the EK diagram as they get accelerated in real space. This connection between the real space and abstract concepts can help them better um, connect uh, with these abstract concepts and understand them better and connect better to the math behind many of the concepts. Concepts are added one by one and gradually the complexity is increased. Um, I've been teaching these courses for the past 15 years and I I have a lot of experience about what kind of misconceptions the students build as they start learning these concepts. So um, each visualization try to, tries to address these misconceptions and clarify them. So that was a major focus as we were designing these uh, visualizations. Um, a text, uh, a guiding text, and also some uh, guiding questions are accompanied with these visualizations. So this way, the students can go through them on their own, or they can be used in an instructor-led instructor activity inside the class. Another uh, approach that we find it very helpful is that we try to make it, make it interesting and educational for all students. By all, I mean students of different uh, level of advancement. Um, so there's a lot of details inside these visualizations. Uh, a student who is beginning to learn these concepts can easily ignore those details and just look at the big picture. Those details are not distracting. But the students who are more advanced can pay attention to those uh, details and connect to more advanced topics. As a result, I've been able to use these tools uh, both in my undergraduate students' uh, classes and also in my graduate level classes. And in both cases, the students were very well engaged and um, they, they, they felt that they were discovering things and learning things on their own that um, it was not possible by, uh, by just um, teaching them on the whiteboard. Um, 
Now I'm going to show you a few examples just to give you a sense of how these uh, visualizations work. Um, so uh, the first one is about hydrogen atom. Um, and after a very brief introduction about this, the, the uh, electrons, neutrons, and protons that uh, form a hydrogen atom, then uh, the planetary model of a hydrogen atom, but then the quantum model. So here they see the nucleus and they don't know where the electron is until a measurement is done. And every time a measurement is done, the electron appears somewhere and it appears quite random. So they can keep clicking uh, and each time the electron will appear somewhere, but there's no you know, clear pattern. Now to help them, we just run thousands of uh, experiments for them and each time a trace of where the electron appeared is put on the screen and then they are asked okay where do you think is most likely to find the electron what is the radius that is most uh, likely to find the electron with it to help them count there they have this tool now they can um, they can um, change the radius within this differential volume and see how many electrons were found there and they can see that if you go too close, the number drops. And likewise, if you go too big, it's the number drops. So somewhere in between the number of electrons is maximized and that's the Bohr radius. They will, you know, uh, comparing with what uh, is shown on the left, they will see that this is noisy. This is not a monotonic uh, uh, plot the same way that is shown on the left. And that's that's natural because They've done only a thousand uh, simulations and the number of experiments is not infinity. Then we just zoom out and remind them that, okay, this was the ground state. This was the 1s orbital. And now you can look at what happens if the electron is in the 2s orbital. And now there is a node in the middle uh, where the num the, the, it's very unlikely to find any electron in that vicinity. And again, there is a place that the uh, probability density uh, is maximized. But then when you go to the p orbitals, that spherical, um, that spherical um, symmetry no longer exists. And um, you have, if you look at the x or y axis, things are different and they can see those uh, on their own. Um, then they are reminded that in many cases when we want to show uh, orbitals, we just use these simplified representations. And often when we reach here, I, I'm overwhelmed by how students react because they always say, um, we've read, we've studied, we've learned about orbitals for so many years and we never understood what it was, what it represented, what, why this shape, why uh, p orbital is represented with this dumbbell shape or 2s orbital or s orbital with uh, spheres. We knew that these are symmetrical, but what do they re what what they represented was not clear. But um, by going through this kind of experiment, they get a sense of what we mean by uh, these orbitals. Another topic that is often problematic for students is the concept of effective mass. And the way that we explain it for them is that if you have a free electron in, a, in free space, if you just look at the equation for momentum and kinetic energy, they both depend on velocity and mass. And therefore you can connect mobile, uh, momentum and kinetic energy. And there is this um, um, quadratic relationship. There is this parabolic relationship but in a real crystal because of the periodic potential due to the lattice um, this relationship between energy and momentum is not a simple parabolic relationship as it is for a free electron but at the bottom of the conduction band and at the top of the valence band we can approximate the band structure with something like this but this time we need to adjust this mass which we call it effective mass to match the curvature and therefore when when you have the band diagram then you can take the second derivative and obtain the effective mass so the approach that 
we took with the visualization, um, you can see it over here. So after a brief introduction, the students are given um, three balls with three different masses, and then they can hit them and give them whatever momentum they decide. So the amount of momentum each time depends on how much they swing this club. Um, the, the heavier ball will move slower and has less kinetic energy, and that energy at the end is converted into the uh, compression of this uh, spring. But every time that they do that experiment, the energy and momentum, the dots appear over here. And if they scroll down, the trend line are shown, and they see that the heavier the particle is, the curvature is smaller. And again, that is reinforced here. If you take the same particle and you make it heavier, the curvature uh, 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 decreases. So this way now it makes sense what's the relationship between kinetic energy and momentum in the classical world. But then we look at a, a lattice, a one-dimensional lattice. They can look at the potential profile uh, when the uh, electron is right on the uh, nucleus, then the potential is minus infinity, and in between it is going to be somewhere less. But if you solve the Schrodinger equation and look at the kinetic energy versus momentum, this energy profile determines the shape here. And this shape is no longer parabolic, but you can approximate it with uh, this shape. And you can um, change the curvature, which basically is that effective mass, and try to match the curvature at the bottom of the conduction band. And that's what we call it effective mass. And if they, again, change the lattice, for example, you go from one material to the next, or um, somehow compress or apply strain, um, the curvature changes. Now the effective mass will change. But now, what does it mean when the electron has a different effective mass? That is reminded by showing what happens when you put an electron in an electric field. So force and, and mass will determine acceleration. So if you have a heavy uh, particle, then it accelerates slower, whereas when you have a lighter electron, it's moving very fast. And at the same time, they see what happens when an electron gets accelerated in the EK diagram. Uh, it, its momentum and energy goes up. So this connection is also very important later. We want to uh, bring in more advanced topics. Then they are asked, OK, what do you think will happen if the effective mass is negative? And if the effective mass is negative, then the curvature would be negative. And again, you can have different effective masses, but this time the, ele the electron will move in opposite direction of the, electric, the, the force because it has negative mass. Um, and again, um, it's the same story, but this time it's just the opposite direction. And they are reminded about what happens in the valence band. The electrons at the top of the valence band have negative effective mass. The ones at the bottom has, have positive effective mass. So if you have a fully occupied valence band, when you apply an electric field, the, the, the movement in opposite direction of these electrons will cancel uh, each other, and therefore there's no conduction. So that's why a fully occupied valence band does not contribute to conduction. And this is, again, one of those uh, common misconceptions that students have about why a fully occupied valence band does not uh, conduct. Many times they say, oh, these because the, the, valence, the, the electrons have formed bonds between the um, nearby atoms, and therefore they cannot move. But in reality, the electrons in the valence band can move, and they move, but it's just that they cancel each other because of the positive and negative effective masses. Um, another uh, example is carrier generation and recombination. Uh, we teach them by telling them the population, the rate of change in population depends on generation and recombination. And with some simple math, we show them that this rate of change in population with time depends on how much we have deviated from equilibrium and what is the carrier lifetime, which depends on uh, the majority carrier concentration, at least in um, 
in um, direct band gap materials. So this, all of this math and uh, everything that I discussed, they can be uh, learned with some simple visualizations that uh, you can see over here. So first we show them what happens during generation. Um, each generation creates an electron hole pair. The shining light brings their attention where a generation event is happening. And at low temperature, this generation rate is relatively low, but if they, um, um, they come here and change the temperature, they can see how quickly the generation rate will go up. And with generation alone, population only grows. If you only have generation, you just add more and electron hole pairs and therefore the population is increasing. But then uh, we show them what happens uh, with recombination because now electrons and holes, when they come close, they can recombine. And the circles around each recomb uh, recombination event again brings attention to that event. And they see that gradually as population is dropping, the recombination rate is also dropping because electrons and holes find each other um, less frequently. And then by hovering their mouse over this, they can inject more carriers into the system. And then they see that the um, recombination rate again goes up. Um, now, um, in, in the real life, at a constant temperature, you have both recombination and generation. And initially, let's say at, so you start from zero temperature and you just uh, elevate the temperatures to a certain value, generation causes population to go up and gradually with it, recombination also goes up until they become equal and we reach uh, uh, equilibrium. And in the next um, uh, step, what they can do is they can actually change the temperature and they can see what happens uh, with this population. If they suddenly lower the temperature, um, all of a sudden uh, generation rate drops and then it takes some time for recombination to bring back uh, the, pop the, the, the system into equilibrium. And likewise, if they increase the temperature suddenly, generation uh, Catch, uh, increases very rapidly and population grows and then with it recombination gradually grows until uh, we reach equilibrium. Another topic uh, as an example is density of states. Again, not easy to um, communicate, especially at the beginning. We tell them that it's the number of energy states per unit volume per en unit energy and um, uh, in the conduction band and valence band, it depends on the square root of um, how far you are from the band gap. And we plot it over here. But to grasp it, it's uh, always a challenge uh, and, and explain it in a way that they can get it. Um, but then, then we add the concept of, okay, those states, what's the probability of them being occupied with Fermi energy? and once you know the probability and the number of states, you can integrate to find how many total number of electrons and holes you have. And if you do the integration using some approximations, you reach this law that tells you that the product of N and P, the number of density of electrons and holes is constant. Uh, and then we introduce the charge neutrality, uh, which helped them to calculate number of the density of electrons and holes when you have a high level of doping. Uh, the majority carrier concentration is equal to the doping concentration, but the minority carrier concentration is inversely proportional to that. Why? You see through these equations. But with a better visualization and better explanation, uh, this can all be very intuitive. So um, here, let's go through this chapter. So here they are shown the band diagram, but they have, are given a magnifier that they can go over um, the, band diagram, the band diagram and see even though the band seems to be continuous, 
these energy states are quantized if you magnify this much. So this delta E here is just 10 to the minus 20 electron volt. And they can count and they can see that as they move away from the band gap, the number of states within this tiny region of energy actually uh, increases. So that's the square root uh, relationship. And, and, and in some of my classes, they, I ask them to plot the density of states as a function of energy, and they can see exactly that relationship. Then they have the option of changing the volume and see that um, if you change the volume, the density of states increases. So if you uh, increase the volume by a factor of 10, within, the, uh, within a 10 times smaller box of energy, you will see the same number of uh, states. Then um, the next is the concept of Fermi function and the probability of these states being occupied. So at any given temperature, they can um, now again hover over the energy state, but this time they will also see how many electrons exist. So they see that there are 15 energy states, but so few electrons, and that's because the probability of these states being occupied is so low. Uh, and on the other hand, on this side, they see what happens in real world uh, and they can change the temperature. And on the right hand side, they will see how the population changes. But at the same time, I, they can see uh, in this box how the probability of these states being occupied will uh, change. So um, again, they can change the temperature. And again, they can see how uh, the population of electrons uh, change. Now, uh, one thing that I want to quickly show you is that then they can introduce dopants. And when they introduce dopants, um, they see that the majority carrier concentration will be equal to the number of dopants. And also, they can see why minority carrier concentration is going to be so low, because as soon as an electron hole pair is created through generation, that electron is going to uh, be uh, recombining with uh, the, whole, the, the many electrons that are right next to it. And again, they can go through the temperature, and they can look at the Fermi function, and they can go through many details over here. Um, the last one is on drift velocity and, um, and how that is um, affected and how mobility at low electric fields is different than what it is at higher electric fields and also how the band bending happens. So um, just a quick uh, demonstration here. Um, here they see the movement of electrons um, inside the real space inside the band diagram and they can see the trace of these and later they can apply an electric field and they can see that initially when the electric field is small the movement or the change in electron movement is so small so that's a very tiny change in the path and therefore as a result the uh, the uh, mean time between scatterings does not change Whereas when you apply a very large electric field, then uh, now the, the, uh, the, the, the path that the electrons take changes quite drastically. And uh, now you begin to see the scattering time decreasing. If you keep increasing the uh, electric field, then also the mean free path begins to shorten. And that's because of the optical phonon scatterings. So, um, um, uh, they, 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 they see the movement on the band diagram and the electrons coming down from uh, uh, downhill from the band diagram and then they can do it for holes. They can see that it's going to go upward, but they also see the um, uh, velocity saturation. So to wrap up, um, these immersive virtual worlds are quite capable in helping students have an experiential learning and accelerate tuition develop, intuition development. Um, 
We, I believe that we can change the student perception about these courses from difficult, intimidating, and does not make sense to something like engaging, amazing, useful. Um, these educational tools should supplement rigorous mathematical formalism. So they're, they're not intended to replace uh, rigorous uh, teaching. Uh, the quality of the educational tools that we develop are going to be key in achieving our goals. If, if, if they are not high quality and the students don't have a good experience playing with them, then they're not going to use them. And it requires a lot of sustained, synergistic, and multidisciplinary research and development efforts. And at the end, I just um, want to show our amazing team. Uh, there are many students, faculty uh, from different programs that have contributed to this work. With that, I would like to stop and answer um, any questions. Thanks very much, Azad. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and I appreciate everybody sticking around. We, we do have a couple of minutes for questions. We have a couple of questions already, but if you want to type something into the Q&A, uh, we'll get to them as quick as we can. So the first question is from Daniela, and she says, very interesting content, and I appreciate the lens of inclusion. I will definitely be sharing with my educator network. Uh, 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 just a, a note, Daniela is an education coordinator at the uh, Stanford site of an NCI. Uh, yeah, what are the direct that. links to the game and visualizations? And I think that's the link at the bottom of the slide there. Yes, learnqm.gotech.edu. Right. Uh, and Oliver Brand, who you know very well, says, uh, Azad, this is impressive. I wonder how much development time went into each of these visualization chapters. Um, a lot. Um, so the, the 12 chapters that you see, um, there are the result of uh, three years or two and a half years of work. And each chapter, um, uh, I would uh, work with one or two students um, and we would meet multiple times a week because we had to reiterate through many, many uh, implementations and we had to debug many problems because um, the students that um, do the design and do the, um, uh, the programming often don't have the background in this field. So it's a, it's a very iterative process that I need to explain the concept to them and, I, and, 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 we, and they come up with the designs and together we evaluate it and we go back and forth. And then, then we have to check for any mistakes. And we, because we put as much detail, so for example, the, um, um, everything is with the physical models accurately captured. So all the statistics, everything is correct. For example, when I showed you the, um, the drift velocity and uh, velocity saturation. Um, so, and, and in some cases we have to tweak some parameters so that visually it's more observable. Uh, sometimes if you just go strict with the parameters that exist, then um, it would not be easy to see that effect. So it, it takes a lot of work. Thanks. And, and I guess I'll ask one question since in your in your summary, you mentioned the, the mathematical formalism. And is there any fear that students will kind of um, internalize the visualization and the graphics as a surrogate for actually understanding the underpinning mathematics? Um, so 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 I would turn it around. I, I would say that um, it would be actually good if the students use the visualization to better understand the math. And in many cases, I think it helps them to better understand the math. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think if they decide that they don't need the math, then we will have a problem. That, that's that, what I was trying to get. At. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. So that's as as an as an educator, that's our role to um, to challenge them and make sure that they learn the math and not um, not let them just answer conceptual questions. So we need they need to be asked to be able to solve problems and get to the right answers, but. In many cases, if they have a better intuition, they can use better uh, their mathematical uh, understanding. And another case is, um, I feel that this, if they have this intuition, when they move to the next courses, 
they carry with them a lot more than um, a few formula that may have forgotten. So, and in many cases, just having that physical insight, you know, many of us have taken many courses and we have forgotten all the details and the math behind them. But um, that intuition that we remember helps us uh, to make a lot of uh, progress. And whenever we need, we can go back and read the details. So I hope this will help students get that kind of intuition. Right. Um, I have one, any more questions to, that you want to put into the Q&A? Uh, if not, we will uh, conclude this and thank Azad uh, again for a really excellent uh, presentation. And um, remember to join us again for the next NNCI webinar on September 28th. Um, and we'll see you then. Thanks all for coming. Um, thank you very much. And I want to uh, ask everyone, please spread the word and uh, hopefully more people can use these resources. The more they use, um, the better for us. And also, um, if you see any problem and mistakes, please let me know. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank